Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for tonight's virtual panel discussion. My name is Toby Simpson. I'm the director of the Wiener Holocaust Library, and it's therefore my pleasure and honor to be able to introduce this evening's event. And I think the contemporary relevance of our topic tonight is obvious, but it's also underlined by the huge amount of interest we've had from our audiences. And I can see we're already over a hundred participants this night, this evening. And uh, I, I think even compared to some high numbers we've had for online events during the pandemic, there's a real clear appetite to engage with this topic. I'd like to thank you all for showing up, uh, for engaging. We have three excellent speakers with us tonight, each with their own expertise and insights which they'll be bringing to the table on this topic of Ukrainian Jewish relations, history and Russian instrumentalization. Many of you will have read the library's recent statement condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And since then, we've all been shaken and horrified by what's unfolded in the ensuing war. And of course, these horrors continue as we speak in Mariupol and across Ukraine. In such times when the present is calling us urgently to action, it can feel out of place somehow to look at the past. However, we can't orientate ourselves in the here and now without a clear-sighted view of how we've come here. And that's why I'm so grateful that our speakers this evening will be helping us to obtain an informed historical perspective. There'll be an opportunity for guests this evening to ask questions to speakers. Please do use the chat function for that purpose. We'll filter out the questions that seem to flow on from the discussion and we'll, we'll be posing those to the speakers. Online events like tonight, of course, don't happen by themselves. I'd like to thank everyone who's been involved in organising tonight's event. I'd also like to thank the Library's many supporters, including our major funders, the Association of Jewish Refugees, the German Foreign Office, the Sigurd Rousing Trust, the Ernest Hecht Charitable Foundation and the Pears Foundation. And I'd also like to thank all of our uh, sm smaller supporters and, of course, those who prefer to remain anonymous. Thank you so much. We couldn't do what we do without you. The Wiener Holocaust Library is based in Russell Square in London. It's the world's oldest Holocaust archive. No other institution has collections quite like ours. They're extraordinary in their breadth, their depth and their immediacy. The collection was first begun by Dr. Alfred Wiener, a German Jew who was determined to document the crimes of the Nazis as they were being committed. The evidence gathered by the library has been put to use in countless crucial moments, and perhaps most famously at the Nuremberg war crimes trials following the end of the Second World War. We're of course hoping against hope that this war today will end quickly, and that the search for justice can find a surer path than it has today, both for Ukrainians and for Russians. Until then, we can at least begin by educating ourselves further about what is happening now and how we might play our own part in making a better world. And that's what I hope we can do this evening. As I said, I'm incredibly grateful to our speakers. And I'll now introduce our chair. Dr. Christopher Gilly did his doctoral and postdoctoral research on Sovietophile Ukrainians in the 1920s and warlordism in Ukraine, 1917 to 1922. As part of that project, he wrote about the anti-Semitic pogroms of the period. He then retrained as an archivist and is now working as our project archivist on the Wiener Library's digital transformation project, which aims to digitize a third of our entire holdings. Thank you, Chris, for the absolutely instrumental role you played in bringing this event this evening together. And also thank you for chairing this discussion. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Toby, for the, um, that introduction. So when Vladimir Putin launched his attack on Ukraine, he did so with the spurious goal of denazifying the country. He described the government created by a democratically elected Jewish president as a group of, quote, drug addicts and neo-Nazis, unquote. This cynical exploitation of the history and memory of the Holocaust and the Second World War to justify terrible violence raises the question of how we can discuss the difficult periods of the Jewish Ukrainian past, particularly the topic, topic of historical Ukrainian anti-Semitic anti violence, in a way that circumvents the distorted Russian narrative and sheds light on the current war. Uh, to discuss these and related matters, we have three experts in their fields from the worlds of academia and journalism, all of whom have engaged critically with the question of Ukrainian nationalism's relationship to Ukrainian Jews. First, Alyssa Bemperad is the Jerry and William Ungar Professor of East European Jewish History and the Holocaust at 
Queen's College and the CUNY Graduate Center. Her most recent monograph is Legacy of Blood, Jews, Pogroms and Ritual Murder in the land of, Lands of the Soviets, which won a National Jewish Book Award. It's a fascinating and wide ranging examination of Russian and Ukrainian Jews relationships with the Soviet state in response to pogroms and blood libel accusations in the former Russian empire. She also recently brought out a document collection on pogroms the late 19th century to the mid 20th century with Eugene M. Avrutin. Second, John Paul Himke is Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Alberta. He's the author of a very important trilogy of works on Galicia in the 19th century, but his most recent monograph is Ukrainian Nationalists and the Holocaust, Awun and Upa's participation in the destruction of Ukrainian Jewry, 1941-1944. Awun here stands for the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists and Upa means Ukrainian Insurgent Army. It's the most comprehensive, sensitive and convincing subject in the English language to date. Third, Sam Sokol is a reporter for the Israeli daily Haaretz. In the past, he's been a correspondent at the Jerusalem Post and has reported for the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, the Israel Broadcasting Authority, and the Times of Israel. In 2014 and 15, he visited Ukraine frequently and conducted extensive interviews there. Based on this, he wrote Putin's Hybrid War and the Jews. It gives a real sense of the variety of Jewish responses to the events, as well as the dilemmas faced by a community whose well being was at times cynically instrumentalized by both parties in the war. Each speaker will in turn speak for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we will take questions from the audience. Um, please enter any questions into the chat and we will ask as many as we can. So if I could ask Elisa to start. Good evening, everyone. I'm very thankful to the library and to my esteemed colleagues, and especially to Chris, who brought us all together, and to all of you for being here. I think it is extremely important for us to come together and have a discussion, a serious discussion about history. It is our responsibility as historians and as journalists to counter with facts Moscow's false narrative used to legitimize this horrific war of aggression against Ukraine by distorting history, by demonizing Ukrainians as Nazis, present and Russia presenting itself as the world redeemer of Nazism. And it's, um, you know, to be honest, it's not always easy to be emotionally disciplined when we read about the fact that one in two Ukrainian children have been displaced, when we read about Ukrainian neighbors who bury their neighbors in haste in the courtyards of the towns where they have lived for decades. When we read about what is happening in Luhansk and Donetsk in the Sumy region where Russian forces uh, destroy textbooks and works of um, history that talk about Ukrainian sovereignty or works in the Ukrainian language. And as the great writer Vasily Grossman said in his extraordinary work, Life and Faith, one of the most powerful novels of the 20th century, in which he discusses World War II, the Holocaust, and the Soviet totalitarian system, one of his messages is to speak the truth to power, to wrest language away from the regime means to resist the dehumanizing aspects of totalitarian control that we see taking place now um, uh, in, in what is happening. As a scholar of Eastern European Jewry, I am intimately familiar with some of the darkest pages in the history of the Jewish communities of Ukraine, a history that goes back, uh, um, you know, hundreds of years, uh, that is based mostly on coexistence, not on violence. But I've written you know, uh, a book and, and well, two books about the pogroms of uh, the Russian Civil War, an exceptionally brutal conflict that broke out following the October Revolution of 1917 and that lasted until 1921, 1922. It's a war between different armies and troops vying to control the territories of the former Russian Empire. And, you know, besides the Polish troops, the white uh, movement, we also have the Ukrainian troops that are struggling for independence against the Red Army. And I've chronicled the violence experienced by many Jewish settlements, especially those that are west of the river Dnipro, 
and I've chronicled the complete destruction of some Jewish, uh, small Jewish towns. Um, these, I would say that these tragic pages tell the, the story of between 100,000 and 150,000 Jews who were murdered in the towns and cities of Ukraine, which was the epicenter of the violence during the Civil War. I don't want to get into the details of the military conflict. Uh, there's a lot to say about the context. Um, you know, you have a, a civil war that grows out of World War I. You have famine, unprecedented carnage, shortages of food um, experienced by everyone. And all this, you know, led neighbors to turn against neighbors and very often participate in looting and even killing um, uh, Jewish neighbors. Many pogroms were carried out by Ukrainian forces that were led by Simon Pitlura's directory, the short-lived Ukrainian People's Republic. And, um, and many, uh, you know, uh, members of the Ukrainian forces came to resent Jews, as did, by the way, all other troops at war for an alleged lack of loyalty. So in many cases, this lack of loyalty was identified with a pro-communist position. So Jews are identified as saboteurs of the Ukrainian dream of independence. In fact, many Jews, eh, both on the right in terms of Zionist groups and, and political parties and on the left, the Bundes parties, um, had supported an independent Ukraine at least until the end of 1918 and early 1919, when you have a peak in anti-Jewish violence. Um, and when most, most of them, most Jews shift their allegiance and come to support the Red Army in what we could see as a vicious circle of a self-fulfilling prophecy. They, they, they support the Red Army, not because of ideological reasons, but they choose in a way the lesser of two evils because, you know, as, as a minority group, they choose protection. Uh, and the Red Army killed less Jews compared to other armies or stopped killing Jews altogether. Of course, the fact that there were many rumors of Bolsheviks being led by Jewish socialists or, you know, there were anti-Semitic stereotypes. Um, the fact that Trotsky, Leon Trotsky, uh, was the leader of the Red Army, you know, his Jewish background, did not play in favor of, uh, of Jews who came to be identified as a compromised political actor. But we also have the fact that the white forces, so the white movement that is um, fighting against the Red Army and against other armies in order to reinstate the Tsar, or at least in order to return to um, uh, Tsarist Russia. Um, the fact that this movement weaponizes a discourse of Jewish communism through systematic propaganda also plays a role. And I would say that it also influenced Ukrainian troops uh, and to some degree uh, Ukrainian neighbors. Now, a few comments that I would like to make that maybe can help us understand some of the dynamics at play um, in Russia's war against Ukraine, which started in 2014. Um, so in other words, there are continuities between Russia's um, distortion of history, weaponization of history and the Soviet politics of memory with regard to this memory of violence, especially in the interwar period, which is again, a reminder of the deep ambivalence of the Soviet state towards anti-Semitism, towards condemning anti-Semitism. While the state, the Soviet state condemned anti-Semitism on paper, it was often, you know, eager to ignore anti-Semitism or to weaponize it in its best interest, in the best interest of the state. So with regard to the pogroms, the Soviets shifted between acknowledging them and downplaying them, ignoring them. Um, there is a very ambiguous treatment of the perpetrators of these pogroms. Um, so you have the creation of a state controlled narrative. When the discussion of the pogroms was perceived as at odds, with the regime's interests and priorities of building socialism based on the brotherhood of peoples, 
then the memory of anti-Jewish violence is silence. Victims are universalized. It wasn't Jews who were killed, um, but it was, uh, you know, the members of the proletariat who were killed. And the Soviets preferred not to investigate or punish the perpetrators. We have, for example, many trials against pogromchiki, those who carried out pogroms in the early 1920s, uh, so after the Civil War, who are either not punished or whose crimes of killing Jews are not mentioned at all in the verdicts. On the other hand, the Soviet state could make use of anti-Semitism and pogroms, just in a way like Putin does today, to advance its own interests. One of these being countering Ukrainian nationalism, identified as a national threat for the Soviet Union. So, for example, at the time of the 1926 trial against the young Jew Sholem Schwarzbard, who assassinated Simon Petlura, who had, after the establishment of the Soviet Union, moved to Paris as the head of the Ukrainian government in exile, and Schwarzbad probably killed Pitlura in retaliation for the pogroms in Ukraine. So, as you know, in as a consequence of this trial, the Soviet press starts to cover widely the events uh, of the pogroms of the civil war, collects documents to prove that Ukrainians and Pitlura were responsible for the pogroms and send these documents to Paris to, so that they can be used as evidence in the trial. But the state also uses this trial as a pretext to carry out the systematic campaign against Ukrainian nationalism and its leaders in the late 1920s. Um, especially in 1929, we see this campaign emerging with force when secret police arrest members of underground Ukrainian organizations for allegedly conspiring against the Soviet Union on behalf of Ukrainian independence, and they're all identified as supporters of Pitlura. So this preoccupation with Pitlura was ideologically straightforward and allowed the Soviets to accomplish their objective. Um, it confirmed the wickedness of the political enemy embodied by Ukrainian nationalism, allowing them to conduct also purges in Soviet Ukraine, right? Including of people who had nothing to do with Petlura. And you have, as I said, purges in 1929 in the early thirties, but also during the great terror, 1937, 1938, when many Ukrainians are arrested as Petlurites, as supporters of Petlura. Um, I would like. I would now like to move uh, very, uh, you know, quickly to the present day and think about the memory of the pogroms and uh, anti-Jewish violence of the civil war, and how it has been instrumentalized. Um, I would say, in general, without a doubt, the war launched by Russia against Ukraine in, in 2014 unleashed a wave of nationalist sentiment. Uh, you have the renaming of streets and some memorial events uh, to honor Simon Petlura. Um, so we see a public rehabilitation of Simon Petlura. On May 25th, 2016, for the first time, the country even observed a minute of silence in memory of Petlura to mark the 90th anniversary of his assassination uh, in Paris. Again, he is remembered as a freedom fighter for the Ukrainian people and not held accountable for anti-Jewish violence. Now, in general, if we think about it, glorification of national heroes rarely fit together with the vilification of these same national heroes, uh, meaning that the identity of a hero rarely conflates with that of a perpetrator. And so we see this dynamic taking place in this rehabilitation of Petura. But I want to, you know, um, dwell for a minute on the white, on the rehabilitation of the white movement, um, remembering, reminding you that the whites carried out the worst pogroms on the territory of Ukraine. So in, in 2005, on the initiative of Putin, the remains of General Anton Denikin, who was responsible for some of the most brutal pogroms against Jews during the Civil War, was returned to Moscow. He was buried 
uh, in the National Cemetery of the Donskoy Monastery with great pomposity. Putin laid flowers on this grave um, in May 2009 and really sanctioned Denikin as the symbol of the indivisibility of Russia, confirming this trend to glorify the past through the restoration of this forgotten national hero, but of course, leaving out of the story the fact that he was responsible for pogroms and anti-Jewish violence. So the pogromist Denikin is turned into a national hero and the guardian of Russian patriotism. And finally, and I'm finishing, I just want to remind us that not unlike the Soviet state decades before, Putin exploited the memory of anti-Jewish violence as a means to exert social and political control on the region during his brutal attack uh, against Ukraine uh, that begins in 2014. You know, the state media propaganda tried to recall and manipulated anti-Jewish violence carried out by Ukrainian forces during the civil war, so that in order to delegitimize Ukrainians' independence and, and Ukrainians' aspiration to join the, U the European Union, Putin reproached them for being inherently anti-Semitic and being inherently pogromist. Um, today, following this, this uh, horrible attack, uh, on Ukraine, that this war against Ukraine that, you know, that continues that we have seen uh, since, um, you know, late February. Um, I haven't noticed the weaponization of, of pogroms as much in order to delegitimize um, Ukraine and depict them as a nest of pogromists. I, I have identified one case three weeks ago um, when um, the Russian media tried to play out the fact that there was a pogrom carried out by Ukrainian Nazis in the city of Zhitomir, which during the civil war was the site of a violent pogrom uh, against Jews. Um, but it, for some reason, it didn't. Uh, it, this, this news did not become uh, widespread, and we can we can discuss this later. So I'm going to stop here my my remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was. An excellent overview, both of the the, the history and, and um, the way it's being used um, today. Um, I think we'll move straight on to, um, to John Paul Himke. And um, yes, yeah, so if, if you could speak now. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chris, um, and thank you, Wiener Library, for this opportunity to uh, discuss issues. You know, I belong to the circle of Holocaust historians, and I have to say that all of us have a good idea what Nazis were like. We have a very good idea what genocide was like. And none of us see that in Ukraine. And, um, and uh, the community has been very supportive of Ukraine's efforts to retain its independence in the face of this uh, war. I'd like to point out uh, that Babi Yar was, was uh, partially um, uh, shelled during earlier in the war and just a few days ago, uh, the monument at Trubitsky Yard, uh, the, the graveyard of tens of thousands of Jews near Kharkiv uh, was just hit recently. I wanna say just a little bit about President Poroshenko, I mean, President uh, Zelensky before I move on. It's, it's famous that he's a Jewish president, that he's a Russophone and he doesn't fit your kind of ethno-nationalist um, uh, figure. But I think it's, there's a little bit more to that. Uh, in the 2019 election, he was facing a real ethno-nationalist, Petro Poroshenko, whose slogan was army, language, faith, all of which he understood very much in a, in a, in a nationalist way. And uh, Zelensky uh, 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 ran against him, not on any kind of symbolic uh, uh, program or nationalism or ethno-nationalism, but simply on anti-corruption. And 73% uh, of the population uh, voted for him. And only one uh, region, one oblast, Lviv oblast, which is the most nationalist, uh, didn't vote, for, didn't vote to, to elect him. So... Um, if Putin would, his propaganda might have been more successful in 2018 when Poroshenko was in power. And I, I will add that in 2018, 
the president of the United States would have probably been more tractable than the one that's uh, in power right now. Anyways, to return, to come to the, to the real thing I'm talking about. Uh, people collaborated in the Holocaust, every place where there was a, a, an occupation by Germany or its allies. It, this is true in France. Uh, it's been very slow for the French to um, come to realize that, but they have within the last decade or so. Um, but Robert Paxton had to major, wage a major campaign and uh, to, to get France to, to come, come, come to grips with its Holocaust history. So every place uh, where there was the Holocaust, there were collaborators. There was never a moment, uh, Chris Browning pointed this out, there was a never a moment when the genocidal project against the Jews failed because of a lack of personnel. So Ukraine, in that sense, is not really different. But there is a distinct issue in Ukraine, and that is the influence of the anti-Semitic uh, organizations, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, or UN, and the uh, Ukrainian Insurgent Army, uh, UPA. Uh, they were very anti-Semitic. They were concentrated primarily in the Western parts of Ukraine, Western Ukraine, the territories known as Galicia and Volinia. Um, and there they completely dominated the civil administration and the militias, which engaged in terrible anti-Jewish violence in the summer of 1941. And they were also extremely influential on the auxiliary police, uh, which was responsible for the man, you know, together with the Germans, of course, the mass liquidation of the Jewish population. Uh, Oun and Upa, the nationalists, also uh, um, managed to, to spread out across Ukraine and in very scattered localities across the entire occupied Ukraine. Uh, they managed to uh, set up militias, police, civil administrations, and uh, when they did that, they always posed as the continuation of Ukraine's struggle for independence and as a, a national, uh, the representative of the Ukrainian nation and its wealth. A few points about that. First of all, it's only an accident that Oun, that the nationalists uh, 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 were so dominant. Uh, in 1939 to 41, the Soviets took Galicia and Volynia, they annexed Western Ukraine to the Soviet Union. And the only Ukrainian political party or tendency, which, or actually even any native Polish or Jewish uh, political tendency that managed to survive the, Pol the, the Soviet period of 1939 to 41 was the nationalists, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. They had experience in conspiracy. They had been an underground organization, a terrorist organization, and a, a kind of, well, one man's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. But they were, they were an underground organization. They managed to survive the Soviet period. And because the Soviet period was so repressive, they managed to expand their network. When the Germans moved in, there was no countervailing Ukrainian party. Uh, and they posed, as I say, as the continuation of Ukraine's struggle for independence. When they moved out uh, into the areas of central and eastern and southern Ukraine, uh, they looked up, they, they posed as Pilurites, uh, as, as uh, we heard about the uh, the, the Pilurites earlier, they, they said that they were reviving that tradition of statehood. And this was kind of true. But it was a half truth, because they weren't just interested in preserving or creating a Ukrainian independent state, but one which was a Ukraine for Ukrainians. And that meant not that it would be preferential towards Ukrainians, but actually it meant the mass murder of national minorities. 
So they murdered Poles in the tens of thousands. Uh, usually historians cite an estimate of 60,000, but it's very hard to know. Uh, they were involved in the murder of Jews and other non-Ukrainians, ethnic Germans, Armenians, Roma, um, Czechs, there are instances there. Um, so they were quite a violent organization. Uh, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists took part in the Holocaust in three phases. First, there was anti-Jewish violence in the uh, summer of 1941, just after the Germans uh, invaded. Uh, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists founded militias, Ukrainian national militia, and those militias were involved in the murder of the Jewish population, uh, either helping the Germans or on their own, and probably killed about 15,000 uh, Jews in the summer of 1941. The second phase would be the police. The police were not under the control of the nationalists entirely, but the nationalists had infiltrated the police. And uh, uh, when the, when the, uh, at one point the po police began to desert from German service, many of them went into the armed force of, um, of the nationalists, which was the Ukrainian insurgent army, UPA. That force hunted Jews uh, in the forests and killed them. And in fact, issued an order to the, to the population, and to, to, I mean, pardon me, to the UPA, that they should kill every Jew that they find and any Ukrainian who hides them. So. There's no question that they have this massive complicity in the Holocaust against the Jews. One kind of thing that happens is uh, you can read in, in, uh, in, in Jewish memoirs, and you can read this, uh, for, for instance, in Daniel Mendelssohn's book, The Lost, that many Jewish survivors feel that the Ukrainians were worse, the worst. Partially, I think, that you know, in these mixed regions of Eastern Europe, um, people could be speaking Polish, they could be speaking Ukrainian, they could be speaking Russian, because these languages are floating around, and they still float around over there. They still float around. People use various languages. But, the, but when Oun was posing as the representative of the Ukrainians, then... Uh, they politicized and I think really besmirched the idea of, of any kind of Ukrainian national movement when they identified it with this strong anti-Jewish and anti-minority uh, violent policies of theirs. So lots of people said, well, these are the Ukrainians. And it's very interesting when you read, when you read Jewish survivor uh, 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 um, testimonies and memoirs that you know, a lot of them will say, well, the Ukrainians did this, the Ukrainians did that, usually in a negative context. But they'll also say, oh, there was a neighbor who helped me, there was a peasant who helped me, this and that. Those are also Ukrainians, but they're not identified politically with the Ukrainians. And this creates, I think, a kind of, kind of illusion. Because, you know, there are, there are many Ukrainians. Like during World War II, perhaps 100,000 Ukrainians were involved on the German side. Oh, no, no probably 250,000 were involved on the German side one way or the other as collaborationists or in military formations. But, uh, but the whole population of Ukraine was, you know, about 35 million. So it's, it was a minority movement, but an influential one and had some support from uh, the Germans. Now, this Oun and Upa were the um, recipients of a state cult and a glorification under two presidents, under Viktor Yushchenko, who was president after the Orange Revolution from 2005 to 2010, and particularly under Petro Poroshenko, who was president from 2014 to 2019, 
who followed the Euromaidan. Uh, both of those have been, both of those presidents promoted the cult of the nationalists, uh, denying their uh, war crimes or hiding their war crimes, being silent about them. Um, but you can see the black and red flag at many of the demonstrations, which was the Oun flag. You can hear that now lots of people use the phrase uh, glory to Ukraine, Slava Ukraini, which was really started as a, a fascist uh, salute in the earlier era. And um, uh, President Zelensky has not taken measures to eradicate this state cult, but neither has he promoted it. I think, I think his policy is to let things go and see how, see how they turn out. Uh, now, the Soviet Union never understood the Holocaust, period, or at least didn't recognize it in, 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 in the way it deserved to be recognized. And they never understood it intellectually. And they could not use it effectively in propaganda. Oh, there were occasional little successes, but basically they did not understand what happened in the Holocaust in Ukraine. And for them, it was not a big issue. Mass murder was not a big issue. To them, not the murder of the Jews, not, the, not, not, not mass murder in general, but for them, treason to the motherland was the issue. And hence, they never understood that it was Aoun Upa that was the major collaborative force in Ukraine. They thought it was, well, they concentrated most of their propaganda on the Waffen-SS division Galician, which had a very minor connection to the Holocaust and a relatively minor role in the mass murder of Poles, but who swore an oath to Hitler and were in, in, the, uh, uh, in the German forces. So for them, for the Soviets, this was the, this was the enemy. And they never, never got into the, to, to, to the real issue. Now, Putin had some better historians at his service and made somewhat better use of a more accurate understanding of the Holocaust history and anti-Ukrainian propaganda. But this remained marginal. He was still caught up in refighting World War II uh, in the sense of uh, who was on our side and, and who wasn't. Uh, and again, this is not really the Holocaust, and this has little to do with, uh, with, with, the, with the fate of the Jewish population. Um, in actual fact, uh, Russian scholars or, uh, uh, well, Russian scholars, I would say, published very little on Oun and Upa and their role in the Holocaust. Most of that work has been done by Western historians like Kai Struve and uh, Jegers Rosolinsky uh, Liba or Per Andres Rudling, or people of Ukrainian heritage uh, like Markot Sarenek or myself or actually mostly uh, Ukrainians in Ukraine, people like Yuri Radchenko, Marta Avrishko, and others, uh, has figured very little in, in Russian scholarship or propaganda. Uh, the biggest criticism of Oun Upa and his role in the Holocaust comes from uh, either Western scholars or from uh, Ukrainian scholars, and not from, not from the Russians. They don't really understand it. And you can see that sometimes uh, in how it's figured in the most important propaganda texts of, of, that's coming out of, of Putin's Russia. So in his, in his famous essay on the unity of Russians and Ukrainians of 12th of July, 2021, uh, Putin wrote only the, in that long essay, this is all he had to say about the Holocaust. In the years of the Second World War, the radical groups of Ukrainian nationalists used discrimination against them in interwar Poland as an excuse for terror, not only against the Polish, but the Jewish and Russian population. That's all he has to say about the issue. And he doesn't mention it at all in his major speech on Ukrainian history of 21st February, 2021. Many Ukrainians of a nationalist bent uh, seem to think that all the scholars in the West and all the, who, uh, all the scholars in Ukraine who write about the Holocaust must be in Putin's pay. But really, I don't think he has any interest at all in the Holocaust. I think I'll stop. I'll stop there.
yes, thank you very much. No, that's an excellent uh, uh, coverage of the period. So let's move on to um, uh, Sam. Here, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so before I start, uh, I would like to, to add something to what Pro Professor Himkus had said, uh, that there really is, I think, in the Jewish community, a certain perception of Ukrainians. And when I was working on my book on Ukraine, I mentioned to my great uncle, who was a Holocaust survivor from Poland, that I was writing something uh, about Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine, in this case, the 2014 uh, invasion where they severed Crimea and started a, uh, a separatist rebellion in the Donbass in Eastern Ukraine along the Russian border. And my uncle, who, as I said, was a survivor from Poland, said, you can't write anything bad about the Russians, they saved us. You have, can't write anything good about the Ukrainians. They are, I don't wanna repeat, and I will rip your manuscript up if, you bring me a copy of your book. And that, that's, there's definitely a perception like that. And I think there was a certain perception that I had in the back of my head when I first started covering Ukraine. And in 2014, when the uh, Euromaidan revolution started, I was the diaspora affairs, the Jewish world correspondent for the Jerusalem Post. And I had been on a couple of reporting trips to Ukraine. And so the paper sent me to cover the, uh, the revolution. And when I got there, there were you know, I found a Jewish community that was that was concerned, that was worried. They, you know, whenever there's revolution, minorities always sort of seem to be the ones that suffer. And there was there was a certain amount of concern. And what we saw during during the Euromaidan was actually a ser uh, a small series of anti-Semitic incidents, uh, beatings, attacks. Uh, now it's never been conclusively proved who did what, but there was a suspicion within the Jewish community, voiced very loudly by. Ukrainian Jewish leaders that these attacks were provocations by the Russians. And what we saw in the over the course of 2014, 2015, and 2016 was a barrage of Russian propaganda about Ukrainian anti-Semitism. And uh, this manifested itself in official statements, in uh, fake news reports in Russian uh, state-controlled media, and in social media postings. So uh, when, uh, when President uh, Putin tried to justify, he gave a big speech trying to justify uh, Russian action in the Crimea. And one of the things he said was that Russia has to intervene to prevent a, uh, a rampage of reactionary and anti-Semitic forces. And as I said, we saw this barrage of propaganda. I remember once uh, someone sends me a link to a story in, uh, in Izvetsia, and it said that members of a far right group in Ukraine were attacking Jews in, across uh, the port city of Odessa. And I was in Israel at the time and I call up uh, one of the community leaders in Odessa and I go, is there a pogrom in Odessa? And I hear him call over to another guy in the room, hey, is there a pogrom going on? And he comes back to me and he goes, no pogroms here. What about in Jerusalem? Uh, and we, we saw that happening over and over the Russians, would accuse the Ukrainians of being banned rights, followers of uh, UN leader Stepan Bandera. Uh, and they kept making these anti-Semitic claims, uh, claims that Jewish newspapers were being shut down, Jewish schools were being shut down, Jews are being beaten up here, being beaten up there. And there were a number of provocations. In one case, a reform synagogue in Crimea, uh, within about a day after the first Russian unmarked Russian troops showed up on the peninsula, the rabbi shows up in the morning and finds anti-Semitic uh, and neo-Nazi graffiti on the door. Now he is a bit confused because there's not a large far-right presence in Crimea. And this happens the day after the Russians come. Uh, so he decides after a few weeks, he wants to leave. He doesn't want to live under Russian occupation. And the Russians send a team from Russia today, from RT, the, the network to, to cover his move. And after the move is done, uh, they air a segment in which they, selectively edited his comments so that instead of saying that he's moving to escape the Russians, he's suddenly saying he's escaping to uh, moving to escape Ukrainian nationalists. And this rabbi told me afterwards, you know, that he felt like he needed psychological help. This like, you know, just destroyed him. Like, oh, how can, how can they do this? And uh, I think part of the reason 
was that the Obviously, the, the issue of anti-Semitism wasn't something that was motivating people in Russia or Ukraine. This wasn't about Jews, and nobody cared about Jews per se. But the Russians did care about uh, making their people perceive the Ukrainians as dangerous nationalists, as Nazis. And since the Holocaust, the easiest shortcut to making someone look like a Nazi is accusing them of anti-Semitism. So it was really instrumentalized. And you have to understand the role of uh, you know, the memory of the Second World War, the victory in the Great Patriotic War against the fascists has a lot of cultural resonance in Ukraine. And if you, I'm mean, in, in, in Russia, and if you can really tar your opponents as fascists, you go a long way to winning public opinion to your side. Uh, and as sort of like a counterforce to what the Russians were doing, the Ukrainians looking to create their own, uh, you know, narrative shorn of all, uh, you know, Soviet influences, their own new national stories and they looked back to history to figures who had fought against the Soviet Union, against Russian imperialism. And they decided under Poroshenko to revise the memory policies of, uh, of Yushchenko to honor people like uh, Bandera and Petlura and Shukhevich. And uh, the difference being this time, uh, the difference being though, that while the Russians were accusing the Ukrainians of being anti-Semitic, the Ukrainians were uh, trying to sort of whitewash the, the history to say, no, these people saved Jews, they were on the Jewish side, they were Democrats, they were progressive. Uh, and this was really something worrying to the Jewish community, but really the, the, the idea that the Ukrainian state was, was Nazi or fascist was just ridiculous. Uh, prior to the Euromaidan revolution, about, if I remember correctly, about 7% of the Yvrokovna Rada of the Ukrainian parliament was comprised of members of the far-right anti-Semitic Svoboda party. These are as close to band rights as you can get. After the revolution, their, uh, you know, their popularity cratered. Uh, once anti-Russian sort of politics became mainstream and wasn't confined to, to these groups, uh, I, you know, they just kept losing election after election. I think out of more than 400 lawmakers now, there might be one representative of Svoboda and some of what, we, you know, at, at we've seen this sort of fall of the far right in terms of electoral popularity, in terms of political influence. We did, we did see during this period, uh, you know, the rise of certain far right movements like the Azov Battalion, which I think was tolerated because it was fighting the Russians and the formation of its own sort of street vigilante groups, which engaged in, you know, violence against members of the Roma and the LGBT community. Uh, but politically, the far right, like the extreme far right, really was was marginalized. And after Zelensky won, you know, in a landslide against Poroshenko, we saw a couple of you know really encouraging steps. One of them was that he sidelined uh, the uh, very powerful and influential Interior Minister Arsen Avakov, who was really seen as a patron of far right groups. Uh, and second is that he uh, purged the. Uh, Ukrainian Institute of National Memory, which really ran memory policy, helping push the renaming of streets and educational programs. He replaced the head of the uh, of that institute, uh, Volodymyr Vyotrovich, who is an avowed Banderite, with uh, Anton Drobovich, whose previous position was working at the Bobby Yar Holocaust Memorial. And there, there was a limit to, I think, to what Zelensky was legally able to do because uh, a 2015 law that had been passed in the Rada essentially made it uh, illegal to denigrate the UN and the UPA and other groups that fought for Ukrainian independence. So while Zelensky couldn't, you know, repudiate Ukrainian memory policy legally, and keep in mind, this probably was nowhere near his top priority, uh, given the fighting in the East and the uh, you know, and the issues of corruption and economic problems, but he he was able to at least stop the outright uh, glorification of these groups. And I think what, what differentiates the uh, conflict we're seeing now with the conflict of 2014 is that uh, rather than specifically pointing to Jews being, being attacked, that sort of rhetoric really isn't being used now. They're using a much more sort of generic rhetoric of, uh, 
of genocide against Russian speakers and against residents of the eastern Donetsk and Lugansk uh, provinces of Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast. Uh, and we, we saw that with the claims from uh, Putin uh, last month on the 24th, uh, the day he invaded, when he said that they have to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine to stop a genocide. Uh, when Yad Vashem, Israel's Holocaust mem uh, Memorial and Research Institute called out the Russians on that, uh, the spokesman for the Kremlin, Peskov, actually told uh, Russian reporters that he extended an invitation to representatives of Yad Vashem to go to the Donbass to, uh, you know, to view the mass graves for themselves uh, after the war. I don't think that Yad Vashem is going to take them up on it. I don't think there's any mass graves to be seen. The only mass graves we know of in Ukraine right now are the mass graves being dug by Ukrainians to bury their own people who are being massacred by the uh, indiscriminate shelling on, on uh, Kharkiv and on Mariupol, uh, which is heartbreaking. Uh, the last time I was in Mariupol was uh, just a few, uh, a couple days ago, marked, I think, seven years since last time I was in Mariupol. Uh, and uh, I've been there a few times and it's to, to see, you know, it was never a very pretty city, but it was vibrant. It was, there was, it was alive. Uh, it was very industrial, but, you know, you could see life, you could see people being, uh, were happy, people enjoyed where they lived. And to see it reduced to that uh, is horrific. The, the, the uh, issue of Nazism though, even if anti-Semitism isn't an issue in the war, the issue of Nazism is, and, while the Russians have accused the Ukrainians of being Nazis, which is uh, a, you know, a claim that it has been heavily repudiated by members of the Jewish community in Ukraine, uh, every single community representative I've spoken to has basically said you know, that they think it's ridiculous. Uh, but the, the issue of Nazism has still come up. And that's because the Ukrainians have made counter arguments accusing the the Russians are being Nazis, of acting in a way similar to the Nazis. And Ukrainian representatives have repeatedly accused the Russians of carrying out a genocide of the Ukrainian people. In fact, when he when uh, Zelensky addressed the Knesset recently, he made that pretty uh, you know pretty clear, drawing a direct parallel between the uh, Second World War genocide of the Jews and what's happening in Ukraine now. Uh, you know, drawing a very harsh, uh, you know, uh, put down from Israeli Prime Minister Bennett. So, you know, I think I think what it always comes down to in Ukraine is that the past isn't the past. The past isn't done. We're still refighting these battles over and over because they have power. Historical narratives aren't something you read in a in a textbook. They're people things that people fight and die and bleed over. Even today, and I think, you know, living in the West, living, uh, you know, in modern progressive societies where we always look to the future and everything's about the newest gadget and the newest television show, we sort of miss out on, you know, realizing how much narratives about the past still control how we behave and the assumptions that we make on a day to day basis. So I'm not a, I'm not a scholar. I'm not a historian. Uh, you know, when I wrote my book, a lot of the background who came from scholars like Professor Himka and Per Rudling and uh, Tariq Amar. But, uh, you know, I've seen the, the results of this type of discussion of history up close and in person uh, in my, uh, you know, in my travels. And I'd like to, before I wrap this up, I'd like to give one example of how this affects people is that in 2014, I was in Donetsk uh, after the separatists took over. And I spoke with the rabbi of the community there, Pinchas Vyshedsky. And Vyshedsky is an Israeli rabbi who came, you know, after the fall of the Soviet Union and tried to rebuild an organized Jewish community in Donetsk. And he succeeded. And in 2014, when I visited him uh, under, you know, under separatist occupation, he said, we're not going to leave. We're going to stay here. We're not going to be forced out. And a few months later, he was gone. And I asked him what had happened. And he said, you know, it was too much. Everyone was running away. He had to get out. He had to save the community. And they rebuilt in, in Kiev, a new community for, 
for refugees. And I saw in 2016, the interim synagogue that they had in a rented house. In 2020, I saw that they built a brand new three-story community center and synagogue for, for Jews who had been uh, you know, displaced from Crimea and from the Donbass. And I most recently spoke to him when he had to lead a convoy of, if I remember correctly, more than 30 cars with over 200 people you know, out of Kiev to Romania. And this is the second time in under a decade that this Jewish community has been destroyed because of arguments over Nazism and history. Uh, the, the, the irony is here, here is that the group that is, you know, saying that it's fighting the Nazis is destroying Jewish life in Ukraine. Uh, in Kharkiv, they've bombed the Hillel house. They've knocked the glass out of the windows of the synagogue. Uh, I, something, I don't know if it was a rocket uh, or shrapnel, something made a hole in the roof of the yeshiva dormitory. And the Jewish day school, you know, uh, wasn't destroyed, but all the windows were, you know, blown out. And, you know, this is not a group that's fighting fascism uh, or fighting for the rights of the Jews. The, the Russians are destroying Jewish life in, in Ukraine. That's not their goal. They don't care one way or the other, but that's functionally what's happening. Thank you for that. Um, excellent paper, and, and which also ends on a very powerful and important note, I think. Um, I'm just going to wait for a few more questions to come into me. So if you have any questions and would like to ask them, then please uh, send them directly to me in the chat. Um, while I'm waiting for a few more to come in, I mean, there, there are two very strong continuities that came through to me in, in what you were saying. One, what you were all saying, one is the um, Soviet and post-Soviet Russian use of the Holocaust, of other cases of Jewish suffering um, for its own political ends um, that has very little to do with um, uh, the Jews themselves. It, it's uh, They become an object of of um, Soviet and post-Soviet Russian politics. The other, the other history, the, the other continuity, which um, Sam particularly picked on at the end, was all of these periods involve the history of, of, of Jewish displacement, of them being forced, of Jews being forced from their homes as a result of um, violence. And so those are the continuities I saw. But they were, there's also change we see here, here, which is. You have two periods in which um, Ukrainian organizations that claim to speak on behalf of Ukraine or, or, or Ukrainians um, are involved in, 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 in terrible anti Semitic violence. And then we have a very different situation today. Um, U Ukrainian society is, is, is nothing what it was um, 60 or 70 years ago. So I'm, I'm wondering what are your ideas about? Um, what, how has Ukraine, what has happened to Ukraine that makes it different um, to what it used to be? The question is for me, Chris? Uh, you could all answer. Okay. <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, that's an excellent question. I, I wanted to, and perhaps this is part of the question, but it kind of also follows uh, some of the comments made by um, John, Paul, and, and to some degree also Sam um, about the perception of Ukrainians as, um, you know, as, um, as evildoers, as, as Nazis, as violent, as, um, and I, I want to connect this, you know, not only to the memoirs uh, that are available with regard to the, the civil war, when you do have thousands of Ukrainians who actually help Jews flee uh, the war, and when they help them, they are not, they're referred to as my neighbor, but they're not ethnically identified as Ukrainians, but when they kill them, they are identified as Ukrainians. You know, this goes back to the question of continuity. Um, the other point about perception, I think that memoirs that we rely on play a major role in the way in which, um, you know, this, this, the, the, these ideas of Ukrainians as inherently anti-Semitic or, uh, you know, nationalist, 
um, if we think about the, um, you know, on, in the context of Eastern Ukraine, the perception by Jews of what Ukrainians were is, is very different. It just hasn't been incorporated into the history. Because if you interview Red Army soldiers, Jewish Red Army soldiers, they will tell you, oh, Ukrainians, chlopci. You know, you know, they were they were friends. They fought against Nazis. They fought against fascists. So there's a clear sense of the fact that Ukrainians, you know, 1.5 million Ukrainians died fighting against Nazis during World War II in the Red Army. Um, so that memory, and I think that that memory, if we think about how Zelensky responded to um, you know to, to many different questions that were asked him about his Jewish identity and how you know his perception of of Ukrainians, we have to take that into consideration. But the fact is that for American Jews, um, especially in Israelis, the, in your comments, Sam, um, you know that continuity in building up a Ukrainian as you know, anti-Semitic, as violent, as you know, without, you know, I'm not, I'm not in any way saying that, you know, they did not collaborate, many did not collaborate with the Nazis, you know, based on, you know, John uh, Paul's uh, research, but, you know, the memoirs, you know, of Polish Jews are very different from the memories of Soviet Jews, of those Jews who are living in Eastern, in the Eastern parts of Ukraine, which have not been studied, is sufficiently for different reasons. So that those are my comments on continuity. Maybe I'll just just add a, a little a little bit to that. Um, you, you know, the there were very different Jewish communities in Western Ukraine and in uh, the rest of Ukraine. The the Jewish community in the, the old Soviet Union was thoroughly integrated into the society. You know, they had been, uh, uh, they experienced modernization at the same time as the Ukrainians and the Russians did. They began to go to school, they began to dress in a certain way, they became more secularized, etc. So that's why today Zelensky was, was elected and his Jewish nationality really didn't matter because you know, they were all the, and if you look at sociological studies, you can see this, like uh, 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 Ukrainians, Russians, and Jews are the, are closely linked, close, close on the scale of, of um, our people, okay, uh, in the Ukrainian population, because they've, they've had basically the same experience. Uh, prejudices is against Africans, Americans, uh, Canadians, you know, that's where the prejudices are. But most Ukrainian, most of the population of Ukraine doesn't make these differentiations. Also, the, the survival of, uh, I would say that the perception of Ukrainians is particularly anti-Semitic uh, during the Second World War comes from, the, as you say, the Polish Jews, uh, because they actually left and they had um, a lot of time, they, you know, they, they were interviewed by the Central Jewish Historical Commission and many other uh, agencies. And they, they, they remember the Ukrainians that way. But the, the Jews in the rest of Soviet Ukraine, uh, those who weren't killed were mainly evacuated to the East. And they didn't experience, experience the Holocaust in the same way. And when they came back, they didn't go to the West. They didn't go to Israel, Poland, or the United States. They remained in the Soviet Union. Uh, so um, we get a kind of skewed perception because of uh, kind of really demographic accidents and political geopolitical divisions. Uh, I hope that made thing, some sense. Yeah. One thing I would add to that is, well, first of all, uh, you mentioned uh, prejudices. I can't imagine someone being prejudiced against Canadians. Uh, yeah. yeah. But uh, in any case, there's something that I've noticed in, in my interviewing over the last uh, decade, which is that after the fall of the Soviet Union, Jews who were living in Ukraine saw themselves as, you know, the ones who were members of organized Jewish communities, at least, ones who weren't fully assimilated in to the larger uh, cultural context, 
saw themselves as Jews in Ukraine. After Euromaidan and after the beginning of the war in the Donbass, there was a change that I've been hearing from people. We're not Jews in Ukraine, we're Ukrainian Jews. That the Ukrainian part of their identity uh, you know, started to take on uh, more of an importance that they actually started thinking of themselves as Ukrainians. And one of these historical ironies is that while the phrase Slava Ukraini uh, was initially a fascist phrase, I've been, I've heard, you know, proud members of the Ukrainian Jewish community using it unironically uh, in a way that, you know, would probably make uh, Bandera and Shukhevich roll in their graves. So it's, it's very interesting. And obviously you hear Zelensky in every single one of his uh, videos that he posts on Telegram every single day, Slava uh, Ukraini, to, to see a Jew, you know, saying that wearing while leaving Ukraine in a war is just, I don't think anybody in their wildest imaginations would have imagined this even a, even a few years ago. I think it's a sign of how far things have come. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I've got one question coming in, which is kind of about the future. You've talked about the past, pos your prospects for the future, uh, how you see them. Uh, namely, um, uh, what, what do you think the prospects um, for the future uh, are in Ukraine in terms of anti-Semitism uh, and um, far-right nationalism once the war is over, hopefully uh, soon and um, with the complete removal of Russian troops from, the, from Ukraine? Um, and how do you see that both in the Ukrainian territories and sh should uh, Russian influence remain in the Donbass? How, how do you think it would... Uh, how do you see that? Okay, I, I guess I'll start. Um, first of first of all, what I fear the most is the backlash uh, against refugees in Eastern Europe. You know, we have almost four million uh, Ukrainians who have uh, been, you know, welcomed and and helped um, in different Eastern European countries, um, Poland primarily. But I don't know what you know, what the backlash might be. Um, in Russia, I have been following Russia and uh, Jewish organizations in Russia are being, uh, first of all, many Russian Jews have left, um, Russian Jews or, uh, you know, Russian Jews, why, you know, a broadly defined uh, or, you know, uh, individuals who have one Jewish grandparent or, uh, who have adopted a child who is uh, Jewish, uh, they have, uh, you know, uh, fled to, um, to Israel. And some of them, you know, fear perhaps, um, you know, anti-Semitism. I've, I've also noticed that there are several Jewish organizations in, uh, in Russia, like Feor, who have um, issued statements in support of the war um saying you know we fear anti-semitism and it is it, you know i am this is not the exact wording but you know the we fear anti-semitism and uh you know russia is conducting a war against uh, nazism so it plays into um you know they're, they're being forced to do that um but to go back to ukraine you know, I just want to go back to this idea of the fact that, and I hope this stays, I hope this doesn't change after the war, although I, I can't say, but um, there has been a clear, um, you know, a clear shift from the, the um, you know, this ethno-nationalist patriotism and ethno-nationalist sense of identity to a civil national sense of identity in a civil uh, uh, civil national uh, patriotism, um, almost a shift to a pluralistic Ukrainian identity in, in Ukraine. I mean, I, I want to go back to the fact that Zelensky is uh, Jewish. This, I cannot think of this being possible in Lithuania, in Poland, or in Hungary. I also want to remind us that Zelensky passed a law against anti-Semitism. There is a law against anti-Semitism that was approved by the Rada in the fall of 2021. And some members of the parliament, you know, 
went to the Rada wearing, um, you know, uh, a head covering, uh, a kippah, uh, a yarmulke. So, uh, you know, there is this law against anti-Semitism. I don't know, you know, I hope that Zelensky will stay in power after the war, but, um, you know, I just wanted to remind us of, of that. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll just to keep the order. Um, I don't think anti-Semitism was, was, was very lively in Ukraine before the war. Uh, Western Ukraine, it, it kind of remains because it's a strong nationalist uh, region. There might be some kind of prejudices as you always find against uh, other people that, that might be from outside your group. There is this small, you know, neo-fascist, uh, anti-Semitic people, but I don't, I can't imagine um, a large group of Ukrainians gathering together and saying the Jews will not replace us or anything like what we've seen in America or, you know, it's, it's, um, there's sort of, or in Hungary, you know, the George Soros is not considered an enemy of Ukraine. During the war, there's been no hesitation, as Sam says, on the Jewish side. They support the Ukrainian effort. And, uh, well, that's all I'm going to say, really. I, I get a little choked up about the war. Yeah. It's, uh, honestly, I'm, I'm sort of wary, of, as a journalist, I'm a bit wary of prognostication. One, because I see a lot of bad hot takes. Uh, and my feeling is that if people who are much wiser than me hesitate to make pronouncements, I won't. Uh, my profession is more describing what is happening and what has happened rather than making predictions about what will. Uh, what I can say that if Zelensky, after the war, does not want to continue in politics, I hope he makes another, uh, another sitcom because I've been... Uh, a big fan of his comedy. What what's something that's just you know sort of uh, I don't know how relevant it is, but something that's just been interesting to me about his leadership is there's you know a saying in the entertainment business that the best dramatic actors are comedians, and I think part of what's been so amazing about his leadership, a lot of it is organic. It's who he is. It's a lot. It's just sort of come out and been able to flower because of the circumstances. But part of it, I think, is that you know he prayed the president on a television show before becoming president. And now when he's in a war situation, he's able to use those skills that he's developed as an actor to turn himself into someone who can inspire a nation. Uh, I think in a, a lot of ways, he's what Ukraine needed right now. Uh, you know, you, you don't see Putin on the Russian side going and making videos and being accessible and speaking off the cuff. He's, he's, use those skills as, as a comedic actor, transitioned, so to speak, to a dramatic actor as president, and he's really putting those skills to good use. And if he goes back to comedy, whatever it is, uh, I'll watch it because he, he's a funny guy. So um, there's a question here specifically about the um, glory to Ukraine slogan. Um, and the person asking um, the question wants to ask whether does it indicate that Ukrainians are, one, unaware of their country's true history, or two, at the very least, highly nationalistic? And I would add three, something or something else. Um, and uh, is, if national sentiment is uh, very strong, what are the implications of that for um, Ukraine's relationship with uh, Europe and its prospects of joining the EU? I probably should. I probably should yeah, start. Sure. This. Um, you know, I can't use that. I can't use that phrase. Slava Ukraini, glory to Ukraine, Heroim Slava. It's because of my my work. You know, I've I've uh, I know where that comes from. I know what it meant at certain times, uh, and I just can't use it. So I I use stand with Ukraine as my kind of slogan. I think most people don't go deeply into issues. It's my view of people. And uh, what's sort of coursing in the Ukrainian community is that this is a slogan 
whose meaning uh, either has been changed, you know, that now it means uh, glory to the heroes of the Euromaidan and now the heroes of the war. And, uh, and others have this kind of, to me, and totally anti-historical, but nonetheless propagated by various, uh, various um, spokespeople. That um, this is a, a, a Slava Ukraini is an older uh, greeting that you can find traced here or there. But in reality, you know, it, it comes out of the Euromaidan and the glorification of Bandera. So uh, I can't use it. Other people use it. I think language changes. You know, there are words we no longer say. And I think that at some point, this particular phrase will, uh, I hope, uh, go into desuetude, which is disuse, a big word for disuse. Yeah, it, it feels with this phrase that it's something that, you know, meanings change. And I don't think it necessarily has the same connotations in the mind of a lot of people that it once did, but it's certainly something that, you know, is, is disturbing to hear, even from people who are, don't mean it in the, you know, in a, any pejorative or fascist sense, it still, you know, has a lot of connotations for, for at least for Jewish people. You know, I, I agree with, um, uh, with what my colleagues have said. And, um, you know, I, I wonder, you know, when, when Zelensky, for example, says it, you know, at the end of every single speech, as we've been listening to him on Telegram or, uh, you know, wh what does he, th I mean, he is thinking about, is he appealing to the public? Because this has, you know, this, this phrase is so, you know, it has different meanings for different people, but it is an important, you know, uh, slogan. Uh, is he thinking about, um, you know, uh, the context that John Paul has has described? I doubt it. Uh, he's appealing to the public and he he's probably thinking about the heroes of Maidan and the heroes um, who are fighting now against uh, Russia uh, very heroically. Um, but I, I sometimes ask myself, like, I'm for the victory of Ukraine. I have to say that. But I would never revive the slogan, Sieg Heil, which means hail to victory, right? I would never do that. So, I'm, Scott, one more. I'm just going to ask one more question. There's lots, obviously, many more questions that we could ask. Um, uh, but um, I think this one wraps things up quite well. Uh, and um, so someone's written, the minister of my synagogue in London is very ambivalent about the war in Ukraine, uh, quote, because of what the Ukrainians did at Babi Yar, unquote. What should I tell him? Sorry, maybe well, Lisa, you start. I, I can start. I mean, I don't have uh, words of wisdom. Uh, I, would, I would say that it, one cannot generalize just like one cannot say the Jews behave this way, you know, there are Jews on, uh, you know, if you think about politics, there are Jews on the left, on the right, the center, Jews who support Trump, Jews who hate Trump. Um, and, you know, we cannot generalize. Then I would, you know, I would add some numbers from John Paul's research. Um, and, and I would also add what I said, you know, that there are, you know, the fact that 1.5 million Ukrainians had died fighting against the Germans, you know, is, is an important number to, to take into consideration. So those are my two cents. And, you know, I'm just gonna add, I've been studying the Holocaust now, um, really since 1988. I've been writing books on other topics too. But um, so far, nobody has been able to identify what Ukrainians were involved at Babi Yar. We don't know. Could have been the Bukovinsky Kurin, a particular unit that came out of, uh, 
out of Chernivtsi Oblast. Could have been some other local police formations. Nobody has been able to identify it. We don't have any sources that 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 settled the question. Um, so I don't quite know uh, what Ukrainians did. They did something because the Germans could not have done that by themselves. Uh, and I agree 100%, 100% with the idea that you cannot make a generalization about a nation. Uh, as a journalist, obviously, I can't advocate for one side or another or tell people what to think. Uh, it's an issue of professional ethics. But what I can say and what I would say is that if people want to make up their mind about current events, contemporary Europe, it's important not to, uh, you know, only take into account, you know, things uh, up till 1945 or 1989. You know, if all someone knows about Ukraine or about France or about Germany or about whatever ends at the end of the Second World War or at the end of the Cold War, you know, it's it's not. I don't think it's fair to make a decision based on ignoring, you know, the last several decades. So really the best thing to do is to pick up a newspaper, you know, the history books take you so far, and then you have to take the next step, which is pick up a newspaper, understand what's happening now, and, you know, make up your own mind based on, you know, based on what's actually happening rather than something that happened to your parents or your grandparents. Um, well, I build that as the last question. I've just been told uh, we have time for... A little bit more time for another question. Um, uh, so um, this is particularly for for John Paul, uh, but if anyone else has any ideas, and it'd be interesting to hear. Um, what's the Ukrainian diaspora's relationship to both the history and, well, particularly the history of uh, that we've been talking about? Well, the Ukrainian diaspora is much more nationalistic than Ukraine. Uh, that's for sure. Part of the reason for that is that the diaspora is now, um, now dominated by the children and grandchildren of those who left Ukraine after World War II. I'm, I'm really kind of odd because I am the grandson of a Ukrainian miner. Um, uh, so we left before the war, before World War I and World War II. Um, but most of the diaspora now is people who were, as I say, the children of those who, who fled. Now, many of those who fled were involved, let's say, in the propaganda department, uh, collaborating in propaganda. They were writing for the newspapers and under the occupation or editing the newspapers under occupation or they were involved in the police, or they were involved in the civil administration, uh, or they were members of uh, UNO, UPA, or they were in the Waffen SS, Galitsyn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they take a very defensive view of what happened in Ukraine during World War II. And it's very difficult to unseat their, um, their views when they think of their grandfathers and their fathers. Uh, and, and then when I say terrible things about uh, the own or the civil administration or this, uh, they don't want to hear it. Uh, one thing I would add to, to that is I'm no expert on the Ukrainian diaspora, but uh, about a week and a half ago, I got an email from uh, Steve Bandera, the grandson of Stepan Bandera. Uh, I had profiled him for a uh, story for the Jewish Telegraphic Agency several years ago, and he finally got around to reading it now. And he sent me a series of emails uh, accusing me of being in the pay of the Russians uh, because I wrote that he was trying to uh, clean up the, uh, you know, the legacy of his grandfather and that he was telling you know, trying to claim that his grandfather wasn't involved in anything bad. And he really took quite a belligerent tone. Apparently, I'm a Kremlin stooge of some sort. So that was, you know, just an interesting interaction with, I guess, the most extreme 
you know, of of the diaspora. I don't. I, I, I very much doubt he's, you know, uh, you know, uh, typical of the diaspora. But that was my personal interaction. <laughs> A quick follow-up question to John Paul about the diaspora. So, um, who are if you if you were to um, to tell us who are the heroes, who are the cultural references? Is it Taras Shevchenko? How is Taras Shevchenko versus Bandera? You know, in terms of also of the younger generation. Um, you know, what kind of who are the the cultural references? National heroes. Um, you know, children recite the verses of Shevchenko uh, at various um, public gatherings. Uh, Bandera and Shukhevich are have come to prominence as heroes in the diaspora, primarily because um, I think because they were uh, lionized in Ukraine and. Um, uh, after during the Yushchenko period, and it became a controversial issue, and and the idea that we Ukrainians can decide who our heroes are. So I would say that Sovchenko is, is is probably read a lot less than he needs to be. Don't forget, there's also tremendous language loss uh, in the in the in the in the diaspora. So the probably the most common occupation of the diaspora children is is not various heroes but they like ukrainian culture they like the dance they like the making of the of the easter eggs and 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 um but the, the cultural knowledge in diaspora is, is 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 a very thin stratum you know they don't they don't really know uh know much about the history you know i mean i know a lot because I read Polish, Church Slavonic, you know, I mean, I, I've gone really deep into very interesting Ukrainian history. It's very hard for, for most people to do that. So um, I don't think I don't think heroes are a big issue. The sticking points have been Bandera and Sukhevich. Uh, totally lost now is the legacy of Ivan Franko, who was once mm -hmm. a major, major uh, hero of the diaspora. There are numerous Ivan Franko society, this Ivan Franko library, that. Uh, he was a socialist and a very progressive uh, Ukrainian uh, of the of the late 19th century, early 20th century. So uh, uh, it's it's hard to, it's hard to talk about who are the heroes of the young um, right now. Like if I talk to my son, he's he's in, he's in his later 30s, I guess. Uh, for him, the heroes right now are the Ukrainians fighting against the Russians. I mean, he's just amazed. We all are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank our three speakers for giving three excellent uh, papers um, that I think really were insightful and managed to ca cover an enormous amount of ground in a very short time. And I'd like to thank um, the audience for, for listening and, uh, and for all your questions. Sorry, we thank weren't you. able to ask them all. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Nice to meet you, Elisa. Thank you to everyone. Pleasure. Nice to meet you all too. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.